In this video, we explain how a simple neural network can be used for solving a linear regression problem. And we'll do that using TensorFlow and Keras, which make it very easy to load a data set, define a neural network, and train it in just a few lines of code. In this video, we're going to delve a little deeper into how neural networks work, and we'll do that in the context of a linear regression example in which we're going to fit a straight line through a set of data points. Keep in mind that the power of neural networks comes from their ability to model highly nonlinear functions. But in this example, we're intentionally using a neural network to model a linear function so that we can introduce some new terminology and demonstrate a simple implementation. So let's go ahead and get started. In this first section here, we're importing several packages that we'll need in the implementation below, and we're also setting a random number seed so that the results in this notebook are repeatable. We assume that you have some knowledge of Python programming to follow along, but what's most important are the high-level concepts we cover. The first thing that we're going to do is take a look at a data set that's included in Keras called the Boston Housing Data Set. This is a small data set that's been used for many years, and it serves as a good example for introducing how a neural network can be used to perform linear regression. Here we're using the built-in Keras function called loadData to load the data set into memory. This returns for us training and test data sets where each data set contains a set of features and a corresponding target variable. We're going to use a common notation in machine learning where the variable x is used to store the inputs and the variable y is used to store the output target values. Notice that this is different from an image classification task where the target variable is a class label, but in this case the target variable is going to be a floating point number. Once you load a data set, it's always a good idea to explore it. We'll start by simply printing out the shape of X train. And this informs us that we have 404 training samples where each sample contains 13 different attributes, which are often referred to as features. Next, we're printing out the features from the first training sample and the corresponding target variable, which is 15.2 and represents the median price of a home for a given Boston suburb. The details of the various features are not really important for this example, but rather the main point here is that we might be able to use one or more of them to predict the price of a home. Before we proceed further, it's important to briefly introduce the concept of data splitting. This is a crucial step in machine learning that can help prevent what's called overfitting, which is a condition in which the model performs extremely well on the training data, but doesn't generalize well to unseen data. It's therefore standard practice to split data into three different data sets, training, validation, and test. If a data set doesn't already contain a validation component, as in this case, the training data set is often partitioned further into training and validation components, as we'll see further below. We'll cover this topic in more detail in subsequent videos, but we just wanted to emphasize that data splitting is one of the most important topics in machine learning. In this example, we're going to use just a single feature to keep things simple and make it easy to plot the results. However, you should understand that many different features can be used to predict a single target value. Recall in the previous video where we performed image classification, each pixel value in the input image was treated as a separate feature. And remember that we had nearly 200,000 values in each training sample. In this case, we're going to use just a single feature and the corresponding target value for each training sample. When we use the load data function to load the Boston housing data set, it automatically loads all the features in X train and X test. But we can easily extract a single feature from each record in the train and test data sets. In this case, we're going to extract the sixth feature, which is index five, which corresponds to the average number of rooms in a house, and store that feature in X train 1D and X test 1D. We chose this feature because in general, we'd expect that the price of a home will be highly correlated to the number of rooms in a house. When working with any kind of a data set, it's always a good idea to visualize it. Oftentimes, a data set will be far too large to visualize, but you can always plot a portion of it. But in this case, since we have just a few hundred records, we can easily view the entire data set in the plot below. So here you can see that the median price of a home does have some correlation with the number of rooms in a home. In case you're wondering, the values that are all shown at 50K were actually capped at that number when this data set was created, 
So we don't actually know what those values are, which is one reason why it's important to inspect your data so you're aware of any anomalies that may affect your model. Before we proceed to the implementation, let's just take a look at what we're trying to achieve here. In the plot below, we show all the data points from the training data set. And our goal is to model the data with a straight line, which is defined by a y-intercept, indicated as b, and a slope, indicated as m. So when we train the model, we're looking for the best values of b and m that defines the best fit line through this data. Let's now talk about how we can use a neural network to create such a model. You may have already guessed this, but the values of m and b represent the weights in our neural network model. In general, neural networks have many neurons, which are arranged in layers, so deep neural networks typically have many layers and many neurons per layer. But in this example, the neural network consists of just a single neuron, so there's just a single layer and just one neuron in that layer. In the figure below, x represents the input, which is just a single feature from our training data set, and the predicted output is a single number, which represents the median value of a price of a home. As before, we have a loss function, which is evaluated based on the predicted value of the model and the corresponding ground truth for every training sample. So conceptually, this is very similar to what we discussed in the previous video, except now the predicted output and the ground truth are floating point numbers. What's new here is that we have two different types of weights. Both are trainable parameters, but one of them is called a weight and the other one is referred to as a bias. And our goal here is to train the model to determine the optimum value for these parameters. And this is done using gradient descent and backpropagation as discussed in the previous video. More formally, the weight that connects the input to the neuron is referred to as W and the bias is known as B. In more complex networks where there are many weights and biases, the weights are analogous to the slope of the function and the biases represent an offset. The neuron itself is a simple computation unit known as a perceptron that computes the quantity Wx plus b and typically passes that value through what's known as an activation function to produce the output of the neuron. When using this simple network to model linear regression, we don't actually need an activation function, so the output of the neuron is simply Wx plus b, which is always a floating point number. And just to be clear, when we do specify an activation function, the input to the function, which is wx plus b, is a floating point number, and the output of the activation function is also a floating point number. Networks like this one are known as single layer perceptrons, or SLPs for short. This is a special case of an SLP since it has just a single neuron. Networks that have multiple layers are referred to as multi-layer perceptrons, or MLPs. As shown in the figure, we use the predicted output from the neuron, y prime, along with the ground truth, y, to compute a loss, which in this case is mean squared error. We then compute the gradient so that the weights in the network can be updated. Recall from an earlier video in this series that computing the gradient of the loss with respect to the weights is handled internally by Keras using the backpropagation algorithm, and the weights are then updated using an optimization algorithm that implements gradient descent. The good news is that all these detailed computations are baked into Keras and can be implemented in just a couple of lines of code. With those concepts behind us, let's now move on to the coding implementation, which has several steps summarized below. We first need to define and compile the model, and then we can train it using the fit method. And then once we have a trained model, we can use the predict method to make predictions. In the first code cell below, we instantiate the model by calling sequential, and then use the add method to add a single neuron to the model. We do this using a dense layer, which means that every input is connected to every output. In this example, we have just a single neuron, which we specify with units equal to one, and we have just a single input, which we specify as input shape. We don't need to specify the output shape of a neuron, since that's a single number by definition. The next line of code is always recommended so you can confirm the model architecture, which in this case is just a single layer network with just a single neuron, otherwise known as a unit. And notice that the network has two trainable parameters, which are a single weight and the bias.
In this next section, we compile the model, which prepares it for training. And this is where we specify the type of optimizer to use for performing gradient descent, which in this case is RMS prop. And we also specify the type of loss function, which is mean squared error. At this point, we're ready to train the model. And to do that, we call the fit method, which executes the training process, which is an iterative cycle that updates the weights in the network. Each cycle begins with passing a portion of the training data through the model, computing a loss for those examples, and then using backpropagation to compute a gradient, which is then used by the optimizer to update the weights in the model. So let's take a look at each of the input arguments. We first need to specify the training data, which consists of a single feature that we extracted from the training data set, along with the corresponding target values Y train. We also need to specify a few other things. When we train a model, it's very common to only use a portion of the training data to compute a weight update. And that's what the batch size is used for. Here we're setting the batch size to 16, which means we're going to use 16 training samples to compute a weight update. The batch size is known as a hyperparameter. Hyperparameters differ from trainable parameters in that we must specify them prior to training a model but their values are important and can often affect the performance of the model. So it's very common to experiment with hyperparameters when creating models. Other common hyperparameters are the number of training epochs and also the learning rate for the optimizer. Just for reference, common batch sizes typically range anywhere from 16 to 256, depending in part on the memory available to store all that data. But if you have any doubt about what batch size to use, 32 is usually a good starting point. The next parameter specified is the number of epochs, which is the total number of training epochs that we'd like to train the model for, where each epoch represents a full pass through the entire training set. As previously mentioned, it's really important to reserve a portion of the available data to validate your model during the training process. This can be accomplished by passing validation data directly to the FIT method, or alternatively, you can instruct the FIT method to withhold a portion of the training data so that it can be used to validate the model during training. The second approach is accomplished by setting the validation split input to a fraction, such as 0.3, which withholds 30% of the training data for validation. Before moving on, let's just spend a couple of minutes taking a look at the output from the FIT method. Each line of the output represents a single training epoch, and notice that for each training epoch, you see a fraction 18 over 18. Remember that our training data set had 404 samples, and since we reserved 30% for validation, we're using 70%, or 282 samples, to train the model. Since we specified a batch size of 16, and we're using 282 samples, we need to make 18 passes to process all those samples where each pass represents a weight update to the model. After each training epoch, the FIT method reports the training loss and also the validation loss as indicated to the right. When we call the FIT method to train the model, it returns for us a history object which we can use further below to plot the training and validation loss. Notice that the history object contains dictionary keys that we can use to access and plot the loss curves. As shown in the plot below, both the training loss and validation loss decline rapidly and then start to level off after about 30 epochs of training, which is an indication that the model has learned about as much as it can from the data provided. Notice that the training loss is a bit lower than the validation loss, and this is somewhat expected since the training samples are used to train the model, whereas the validation loss is computed using only the validation data, which the model has never seen before. So now that we have a trained model, we can use it to make predictions using the predict method. In this example, we pass a list of values to the model's predict method, representing the average number of rooms in a home, and the model returns the predicted value for the price of a home for each input. While this is convenient for making specific predictions, it's also very informative to plot the best fit line overlaid on the training data. And this can be accomplished by passing a list of values to the predict method and plotting those XY pairs as a line. In this next code cell, we're creating 10 data points from 3 to 9, and we're passing that list of points to the predict method, 
and that's going to return the corresponding target values for the price of a home for each of the input values. We haven't discussed this yet, but this particular feature, which is the average number of rooms in a home, is computed as an average for a given suburb in Boston. But obviously it doesn't make a lot of sense to have 3.7 rooms in a home. But for this example, we're treating this feature as a continuous variable for the purpose of predicting the sale price of a home. But technically that would only make sense for whole numbers. The next function below called plot data is a convenience function that will plot both the training or test data along with the points that define the best fit line. In the plot below you can see all the training data points and the straight line which represents the best fit line predicted by the trained model. We can also use the same function to overlay the test data on the model as shown in the second plot below. At this point, you would normally compute a meaningful metric on the test data to determine if the predictions are within acceptable limits for your application. Such a metric might be the root mean squared error or the mean absolute error computed from the test data set in the best fit line. You could also use the mean squared error as a metric, but that's much harder to interpret since it involves the square of the housing price. When evaluating a model, it's important to use a metric that is easily interpretable. And so this brings up an important point, that the choice of the loss function used for optimization isn't necessarily the same as the metric you would use to decide how well your model performs. The loss function and the metric you choose to assess your model serve two different purposes. The loss function is used to optimize the model, while the metric is used to make a decision about whether or not the model is good enough for your particular application. For example, if the mean absolute error computed on the test data was $10,000, you might conclude that the model wasn't very helpful. On the other hand, if the mean absolute error was on the order of two to $3,000, you might conclude that the model's prediction is really helpful. If we study the model output compared to the test data, we see that the error seems rather substantial, especially for homes with seven or more rooms. So a likely conclusion is that such a model may not be very helpful and that we might want to consider using additional features to see if that will improve the model's predictions. In case you're wondering, if we had used two input features, the model would then represent a plane rather than a line. And if we had used more than two features, the model would represent a hyperplane that is not really possible to visualize, but mathematically is a linear model in multidimensional space. Beyond adding more features, another option would be to consider a nonlinear model, which we'll introduce in the next video. The main takeaway from this example is more about the process used to train and evaluate a model rather than finding the best model. To conclude, we wanted to emphasize that we covered a lot of information in this video that may take time to absorb and that you may want to revisit this video as you start to learn more about this material in depth. We hope you found this video helpful. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.